So I'd like to welcome everyone. We have a big group tonight. Um, I guess being rainy and not warm outside has delayed everyone running off for summer a little bit. So thanks for being here. I'm glad to have um, so many people here to participate. Um, I think it might be useful uh, to go through who everyone is, because um, I'm not sure everyone here knows everyone. Um, but before we do that, I want to start with a little bit of where we are in the trajectory of this overall project. Um, and so I'm going to, those of you who have seen this a million times, um, bear with me, I will go through it very quickly. So um, right now the town is in the midst of a moratorium. Um, a moratorium is a temporary pause on land use approvals. In this case, um, the town has paused new subdivision applications in the low density residential zone, which is most of the town. And the purpose of this is to um, uh, stop applications from coming in while the town is addressing that zoning that I think there's widespread agreement um, just isn't serving the town well. It's allowing development that the town does not wanna see. Um, so towns adopt these moratorium to prevent a rush to development while new rules are being considered. We wanna be able to consider the rules in a, a calm circumstance, not rushing them out before um, they're fully baked. And the time that we have to do that is between now and the end of the year. Um, going to jump to uh, what we need to do. Um, the tasks that we've been assigned to complete in that time are creating sub areas within the existing low density residential zone um, that reflect and regulate the different land conservation and development priorities that are uh, make sense in the different contexts throughout the town. So the low density residential zone was kind of a blanket approach and um, we really need a finer grained way of dealing with development in the town. There's much more nuance there. So um, we're working on coming up with a variety of zones within what used to be one zone. Other, th other things that are included in this process is adopting public and private road and driveway specifications, fixing some legal inconsistencies and problems in the zoning um, and subdivision. Uh, that conflict with each other or conflict with the town's stated goals and policy positions. Um, I should note that all of this is really built on years of planning um, and public outreach that the town has done um, both through this group um, as well as past comprehensive planning processes. So zoning is built on the comprehensive plan and this is a chance to set the comprehensive plan in regulations that are clear, um, can be understood by members of the community, by people who are buying property, by people who own property, et cetera. Uh, so we have a four quarter schedule. In the first quarter, the town passed the moratorium and we started this process. Uh, we're in the second quarter now. The plan for this quarter was to start with a big public meeting that we had on April 6th, um, getting the zoning uh, process kicked off. Um, work had been going on for more than a year before I even joined the town. So this is, it's not something new, but there's, I think, a renewed um, focus on getting it done as quickly as possible. Um, so our goal for April was to identify the new zones that would be added and the purpose for each of those zones. We did that. Um, our goal for May and June is to draft all of the requirements for those new zones. Um, and that's really our task um, to start thinking about in this meeting. Um, in the, our last meeting, we decided that we needed to see a full map of the town and where all of these zones fit based on the priorities that had been proposed in the past. Um, and we need to nail that down and then move forward with um, drafting the requirements because in June, uh, the plan is to have a full draft of the updated zoning um, that will be presented to the town board, planning board, um, the CAC with three weeks for review and comment. Um, then the town board will hear feedback, uh, give us direction on where to go forward. Um, we'll present changes again in September, get more feedback. Uh, we'll have special working sessions in October to get through any significant problem areas. Um, and then 
have more public feedback in November and hopefully have an adopted code in December. Um, so, so far we're on track. We're at the beginning of May. We're working on the new zone requirements. We've identified some zones. Um, and I'm gonna jump over to uh, where we left off with the, the other group um, was that we, we identified kind of four areas and some overlays. So we identified um, some areas that were highest priority, um, some areas uh, that we really wanted to see very little or nothing have uh, developed in some areas that um, we didn't feel like we could institute as strong of requirements in, but we wanted to prioritize um, open space and rural character. Some areas that we wanted to have more flexibility, but still allow less than we do now. Um, and some areas that were pretty much already developed. And then in addition to that, some overlay areas. The map that we looked at last month like this. Can you guys all see that the screen, has it changed or are you still on the presentation? Yes. You can see it. Okay. So last month we had uh, some pink zones and some dark green zones and then a bunch of parameters um, with feedback from this group. Um, I went back and that is how we ended up at the map of the whole town um, that I'm sure you've all had a chance to scrutinize in great detail. Um, and that we're going to be talking about today. So uh, on this map, um, we've included all of the hamlet areas as well as the areas that are in the low density residential zone. So I want to look, look at these zones. The zones that are proposed here um, is a suburban character zone. That's basically things that were already developed under the low density residential zone parameters that are already built out. Um, and I'm gonna kind of flip this, start with the darkest green. The darkest green is a high priority preservation area. Um, that is basically state owned land or uh, municipally owned land, owned land, preserved land now. So the state forests, um, parks, other lands that we have uh, a lot of control over. Um, the next lightest green is um, labeled here as rural character one and we'll, we'll probably come up with some different names, um, but this is a privately owned land that has a lot of conservation um, parameters. It's uh, places that have steep slopes, places that are contiguous habitat, um, places that uh, include UNAs. Um, it's areas that uh, we're interested in doing the most we can um, with the political reality of we know we can't completely stop development on private land. Um, but this is where the strictest rules would be um, outside of the high priority preservation zone. The next, the lightest green is rural character two. And we talked about this as a, a zone where we would like to see a preservation, um, but we're, we're willing to allow some more flexibility than we would want in the other zones. Um, and we had talked about this kind of in the context of uh, working lands, fields, farms, um, forests that were undergoing forestry, uh, but also uh, having a mix of housing and other uses that were allowed. Um, in addition to those, uh, there's two hamlet zones. And we really, this is the first time anyone has seen hamlet zones laid on West Anby, but the goal for this week was to just start with a rough draft of looking at a whole map. So those are laid out and we'll probably be adjusting them. Um, but there's a Hamlet core and a Hamlet neighborhood. So the Hamlet core is what it sounds like. It's the densest and most flexible center of a Hamlet. The Hamlet neighborhood is the area around that um, that has less allowed uses as more residential in character, but is still part of a Hamlet where we wanna see um, more density than in the rest of the town. So those two uh, tan and orange areas are where the town wants to focus development. Uh, we want to encourage it. We want it to be easy to develop there and harder to develop in other places. Um, so with that introduction to the map, um, I did put a few questions on there. Uh, the first one I'm just gonna read through them and then we'll get into conversation. And Claire, I see you have your hand up and I saw Nancy had a question as well. Um, so the first question is, 
uh, should the water, water district be driving the limits of the Hamlet neighborhood? As you can see here, you know, I followed all of the parcels that have water because water allows denser development. Um, but it's a question of if, if we actually want to do that. Do we want to allow density where the town has invested in infrastructure or is this Southern area a place that, you know, it's served by water because um, there's some issues from an old landfill, but maybe we don't want to encourage development there. Um, and that is some feedback that I've gotten from at least one person who lives in that area is they do not really wanna see um, Hamlet neighborhood level development there and suggested that maybe that stops just south of Sylvan Lane. Um, so I'd like the group to consider that. Um, we also wanna look at, are there other high priority conservation areas? Um, we were committed in our past meetings to not extending that zone into private um, property without people asking to be added into it. So people can ask to have their property added to that. That would be the, the largest lot requirement area. We were talking about 20 acres as a minimum lot size. If people wanted to be added to that, they could, add, they could request to be added. And um, so that is on our agenda still. And then, you know, which zones, which areas are zoned incorrectly? Um, this is kind of a data-based computer simulation that I used a bunch of different data points to come up with um, the way these things are mapped out. And it's not always perfect. You know, it's, it's uh, the result of the process. So, you know, there's some odd things like, why is this little green lot in there? Um, probably because, you know, I was working through the entire town and it got missed. All of those things, uh, little things can be adjusted, which is why we have a process and we're not supposed to be done at the beginning of May. We're supposed to be starting it at the beginning of May. Um, so there's, there's time and process for adjusting everything on here. Um, but maybe this is a good time to pause for a few questions before we, um, uh, move on to um, considering the other proposal that's before the group. So uh, who did I see with hand up? Claire. Yeah, Nancy, right? Yeah. Claire and Nancy. Claire, why don't you go first? Um, mine is just the map display. Um, I don't know whether anyone else had this problem, but I printed it out. And um, on my printed copy, it's completely impossible to distinguish between the rural character one and the high priority uh, preservation. It's easy to see it on, on your screen. Um, but I'm just wondering whether anyone else tried to do the same thing and had the same problem, because it'd be really nice if, um, if it could be possible to make them more diff different. I don't know why, you know, I'm, I'm fine with um, rural character two is, is, is clear, but not not the one and um, high priority. And similarly, the Hamlet and the Hamlet core are a little bit hard to, I, I can figure them out, so I'm not so worried about them, but um, probably the most important one is rural character one and high priority, and I can't distinguish them on my map. So, Thanks, Claire, um, that's, that's really useful. Yeah, I, I think that both the names and the colors and the display of the map will change as we move forward. Um, but uh, it's always good to, especially with different printers, have different people print it out and see how it looks. Um, well, I, I know, I know you want to keep it all green, but but there's there's a lot to be said for making things very distinct, different yep. colors. Yeah, and we can maybe use some some patterns or other things. Make sure everybody you can knows make the what high priority about. red or something. Thanks, Claire. Anyway, yeah. Sam. <laughs> Nancy, well, I see Chuck is hand up, but also Nancy, right? Nancy, Nancy first, she was waiting. You're okay? You're muted. Um, so I see the hand signal. Uh, I don't, oh, Ted, do you wanna go next and then Russ? Sure, sure thing. Uh, I had a couple of comments. The first one actually is a, a, a version of what um, Claire just said. I think it would be one, wonderful if the um, <clears throat> both the names 
and even the the colors and the order of the um, of, of the legend could be rearranged so it's you, there is a, actually a scale involved. Um, for example, uh, you know, perhaps ranging from the high priority at one end to Hamlet core at the other end with, with um, successive increases or decreases in restrictions along the way. Uh, that was one. The second, my second comment is that, or it's really a question um, which leads to a comment. Um, is it necessary that the, 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 the boundaries between areas follow uh, the property lines because, well, because of past history, we have an awful lot of tremendously narrow and long lots. Right. And while you might clearly put, well, I'm looking over at, uh, let's say, Nelson Road uh, near the top right, you might put a certain set of properties in Nelson Road into a suburban area, but the back of those properties uh, you would probably want to keep in some kind of rural area. The same thing probably happens on King Road. I, I know that uh, I'm looking at the properties next to mine, um, the back of some of the Gunderman Road properties, they're a half mile from the road um, or more. And I would hate to see those be any less well protected than the property next to it, which is where, where I happen to live. So the question was, do they have to follow property lines? I had that answer, same question. <laughs> the answer to the question is they don't have to. Um, I would like there to be a very good reason anytime they don't, because it does create a substantial administrative burden to um, dealing with them in the future. Um, it makes it complicated to decide how much uh, development rights they have and how rules apply. And that's okay. If there's a good reason to do it, we should do it. Um, shouldn't go crazy with it. Uh, you'll notice that I, I kind of tried to interpret the kind of bubble of Hamlet uh, neighborhood. And we'll talk about that in the Hamlet group where, where the, how the borders should be, but um, in a way that is uh, all full parcels for now. And um, we can adjust that as, uh, I think, as we can make good arguments for things that should or shouldn't be in the zone. So, yeah, um, actually, well, let me give let me give two examples of things that I think that do have um, a reasonably good argument. Uh, my neighbors uh, don't don't violently disagree with me, but the back of uh, Kevin's and uh, Pat's properties. Uh, the, the southern end of them, which is abuts the northern end of mine, those are clearly not areas for development, uh, not to mention the airstrip that's on one of them. Uh, and an another example, oh, where did I see that other one? Um, oh, uh, yeah, as I said on Nelson, um, there is a, 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 a tiny patch of, uh, of pink suburban uh, on the um, the part of Nelson that runs almost north-south, well, diagonally north-south. And there are properties there that uh, are, they can't be more than a couple hundred feet wide by half mile long. Mm -hmm. And the first, you know, the, there are so many parcels that are of that kind of shape where you, you've got to watch out for it. Um, just a thought. Sure. So, uh, Ted, I'm seeing you suggesting something um, along Gunderman Road so that the southern piece of those parcels are put oh, well, in the more restrictive zone. Probably, yeah. Well, it'd be ideal for me, but my neighbors, I hope they would not disagree. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, you have to bear in mind that some, some of those backs actually abut the backs of things that are on Comfort Road. Uh -huh. yeah. it's, it's, it's not a simple question. Yep. Yeah, I did notice, I noticed the same thing, in, in, especially in the Hamlet, actually. The, uh, oh, yeah. I, the rather I, I, big I, properties there, you know, all the Rose property, for instance, ends up in the, in the pink because of it's, because it's all one property and it happens to front on the main road, but um, in the, in Ditto with right. the 
Russ's property. Yeah. And, and actually, I was, I was just about to say, and there's a third neighbor I'm taking a chance with, but the back end of Russ's property, um, that uh, orange thing that extends westward toward Comfort Road. I mean, mm -hmm. There must be a point at which the hamlet ends and, uh, and, and uh, rural begins. Right. Well, you know, on the on the Hamlet map with, with a working map, we've got sort of orange blobs and they don't correspond to property lines. It, um, so what David's tried to do here, evidently, is to is to take what is mostly in the orange blob and then go to the nearest property line. But uh, yeah, yeah. The, but I figured we might as well get it out in the open. Yeah. But, I mean, I, it, it generates the same concern, though, about being part, you know, once a big property in particular that it not it may not be appropriate to have the whole thing in just because it's all one property. But if you didn't do that, you'd have to have some criterion, you know, so many hundreds of feet back or something. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Ideally. Um, I saw Russ. Russ, you're muted. There yeah, you okay, there we go. Um, I guess on my screen, the pink is showing up white. So I was wondering why the um, highly developed area or the, the part in town that we're trying to make as a hamlet wasn't bigger than that big purple blob, which is, I guess, Eco Village. Right. But I, it's, it's coming up white. Uh, I guess the question along Steam Mill, if you look, I mean, I'm looking in our neighborhood, um, there's houses all up and down Steam Mill. Um, and you know, some of those are light green and some of those are yellow and some of those are pink, but it's fairly well developed up through there. And um, it, it just seems like the color changes without real understanding. Like Zolwig's property is that little square that's to the right of road, but across the road. Yeah, right there, you're over it. That's Zolwig, so I'm not sure why he's not pink, pink which is white on my screen, and why the one on the other side of my driveway right under the L of Mill that's um, a newer neighbor. Yep, right there. So why that wouldn't be pink as well. Um, anyway, that, that just, it just seemed like it was a little strange. And then even the, up at the corner, there's two houses at Steam Mill and 96B that's yellow. Um, the Bryce's house, which is the farmhouse. And then the one on the corner, right at Steam Mill and 96B. Yep, right there. There's two houses right there. That's yellow. The, 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 the south side. Yeah, that one. Yeah, there's two houses there. Yeah. And then there's a whole bunch along there, too, along that road. There's three or four houses right there, actually five. So there's quite a few. Anyway, that, that's all. That, I'm not trying to split hairs, but that's so, all. I'm all. Russ, I, I want to um, make sure I'm understanding your suggestion is that all of these along here should be pink. I, I mean, I just don't understand why some of them are pink and some of them are yellow and some of them are light green because they're all, they all got houses on them. Yeah, I would, may, I would be consistent with it. Right. Um, well, I had, I had, I share Russ's, uh, I don't know what you can call it, confusion or concern. Um, and in fact, um, I don't like the pink at all. Um, I would take it away. That, um, but uh, we could talk about that when we look at my suggestion. Yeah, let's let's hear from Corbett. I saw Corbett had a question. Um, oh, you're muted. There okay. You go. Um, this goes back to. Um, Ted's remarks and, and um, Joel's about the long skinny lots. Mm -hmm. I'm wondering if um, when you look at the, at Joel's proposal, whether that kind of um, well not, I, restrictions, I guess is uh, one way of looking at it, would take care of that problem um, because it would limit the way that a long skinny lot could be used. That's just something to think about. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. All right, I see 
I don't know, Nancy, is that your hand up? Yeah. You're, you're muted. And after Nancy will be Kevin. Um, so I'm looking at the property since we're kind of looking at our own neighborhoods here. And uh, where our house is behind our house up with Bill Farrell has his land in the back there. There's, there's a lot of little areas there that are the headwaters of Buttermilk Falls. There's like three different creeks up in there. And I think we should think about trying to change it to a more preservation kind of area. I don't know if you guys have, I'm, I haven't been to all these meetings, so I'm not sure you've really looked at things from that standpoint yet. Maybe that's down the road, but um, I don't think that's a good area to be developing. That That's a very much a wild and it's all, it's really, you know. Really Nancy, area. could you be more specific about where you're talking about? Because not um, everyone knows where you live. Oh, I'm sorry, on Marsh Road. So I don't, it's hard to, how do I explain where I am? I mean, you can't see my cursor. So on the corner of Marsh and Miller, East Miller, go to your right and there's a, thank you. There's a long uh, lot there. And then it's the lot that, is next to that with some road frontage on East Miller, but then it's all, then it goes back down into Marsh Road down in there. You, be, you, want, to be, you want to be right of the intersection, David, not left. Yeah. To the right, go the other, yeah, that, oh, right there. Yeah, yeah. that lot there. That should be, that should be a more protected area, I think. All of that back in there. I mean, you want to know what kind of changes were, and I yeah. I like up there all the time, and it's I not really that suitable. lot has actually already been through subdivision, and it just isn't reflected. What's um, that? I believe that lot went through subdivision several years ago, and just hasn't been sold off in pieces. Well, he has lots on Marsh Road. That's true, and then. There is a, a lot behind me that's all landlocked, but and that is actually where most of these um, headwaters are that come down, and they go down into Buttermilk Falls area. So, I just think it's important to think about things in that perspective too. But I'm not sure if we're at that point. But that was just I think that should be changed to a darker green somehow. The back of it, I don't know. If you, I'm not sure what all the differences are going to be for all these uh, different colors of green in terms of how many houses can be up there, you know, the development, you, what do you call it, development units? Um, we, haven't, well, we, have to, we haven't gotten into that yet, but um, it's, it's a critically important question. And it is some, it is something that we talked a little bit about and uh, just just for getting people on, on the general page of what we were talking about before, the darkest green we were talking about, 25 acres per lot. The two middle greens, we were looking at 10, with the differences being the darker green would have site plan review, the lighter green would not. Um, there could be some use differences as well, but that was the main uh, difference that we had talked about, and that's all open for change um, still. And then the, the pink we uh, talked about keeping at five acres. Um, so you're not thinking about using road frontage at all with any of these changes in terms of requiring lots? Is that kind of the direction that you guys are working on? Like I said, I'm pretty new to the meeting, so. Nothing was said about frontage as of yet. Yeah, we haven't, we haven't gotten too far into, into what amount, if any, road frontage, or if there are other ways of dealing with that. But there has been some conversations about it. The other yeah. thing to point out about what Nancy's saying is she's trying to take an area that's private property without people voluntarily putting the dark green and throwing it in the dark green. And that's not what we've agreed to because that's taken away the value of land in doing that. So. Well, there are, there are, there are, there are the regular starting areas that. here that aren't you know, I mean, you're just saying that we can't protect, try to protect land, and we're going to designate all these different things, different things. So, I mean, yes, they have been pretty clear at showing that the value, 
The I value think... in the land is the ability to build and basically you're taking away people's value by doing that. And that's not fair. I mean, if the town passed an ordinance that your house, let's say was worth 200,000 and made it worth only 50,000, you you have a problem with that. And, you know, and I, I think you gotta, you gotta be fair and you gotta compromise here. And I understand you like that area and you walked it and loved it, but it's, it's not your land. It belongs to somebody else. If they want to put it in dark green, they has, can. It also has natural characteristics that are important to protect our, our water supply. That's what I'm talking about. This is bigger than who owns what property right now. This is about trying to, to plan for, that's what I thought this was about, the conservation. Yeah, see, I don't see building a house on a property as destroying the headwaters of that whole watershed system. As long as you are you have your setbacks and there's not silt going in and your septic well, is not leaching into it, you're you're fine. It's, it's not, no, you're not. I don't the whole thing the way that you're saying that I it will. I agree with that, but I don't think we should be having this argument here because I think there's I think there's better venues. We could talk privately if you don't mind. Well, so sometimes keep in mind it. You know. the whole thing and I don't really want to do that if that's okay. I'm going to um, mute myself. Hmm. I was going to say, yeah. what, what Nancy proposed just now was not dark green anyway, but, but the sort of medium green. Yeah, I think the answer was saying, green already. You apply it here. Um, yeah, right. Yeah, I, I was going to raise the same point that we're not talking about the high value, high whatever it is, high preservation, really dark green areas. It's simply a change between the yellowish green and the bright green. Right. Yeah. Um, but Kevin Feeney has been waiting to chime in. So Kevin, why don't you go ahead? Yeah, no, um, I would agree with with uh, Joel to some extent on that. And I'm um, sorry, not Joel, um, Russ yes. on, uh, on his comments there. Um, as far as dividing things along, you know, not property lines, but but divvying them up, you know, within the parcel, I understand, you know, Ted's concern with that, but I don't think that's a very fair way to go about it. Um, you know, to some extent, you're you're taking people's opinions of what they value, and turning it into you know colors and stamping them on the map, and as Russ says, changing people's values of their land, kind of willy nilly. You know, yeah, it's you know you've got a, a reason, you know, a, a main thrust of trying to preserve things, but different people have different opinions of what preservation is. And to, to just kind of go draw lines here, there, and everywhere, and even across the middle of a property, you know, and decide, yep, this part's okay and that part's not okay. I, I don't agree with that very much at all. And, you know, and I, I think a lot of it is, rather than hard science, is opinion about what we like. Mm -hmm. And, you know, um, you know, Part of part of rural character is, you know, being out someplace in the country where you're not right on top of something that you don't like, and uh, you know, uh, maybe we ought to, you know, accept that a little bit more. And Ted, the the airport, you know, being there, if you didn't like airports, why'd you move next to one? Actually, uh, I was using the airport as a reason why you wouldn't want it to become a suburban area. <laughs> oh yeah, I, and I don't, I don't want to turn it into a suburb. You know, I don't want to. I don't want to change what we do with our place at all. Um, but, you know, um, being told that I can't uh, kind of sticks in my craw. Well, you know, the, the fundamentally, I mean, uh, dividing a town into zones at all requires, requires drawing lines someplace. And, you know, this whole conversation is about where, what kind of zones ought there to be and where should they be. And, you know, apart from saying that the whole town should be unzoned, which, it, which is, an argument for um, someplace else because we've been zoned for a long time. We're just trying to refine it um, a little bit, recognizing that the town is not all the same. That there really is difference between the south end of town, the north end of town, the middle of town, the edges of town are not all the same. And we probably ought not to have one set of rules that applies to everything the same as if it were the same. Well, uh, that makes sense to me. The the, the thing that uh, well, I mean, I'm going to throw my my neighborhood thing in too, since I'm over in West Danby, I really do think that the, we don't really want to create a South West Danby. And uh, the, the Hamlet Center and the uh, 
the area on Hillview Road there that you, which is still within the water district, is separated by almost two miles. Um, and so that's not, to me, it doesn't make any sense for there to be that secondary, um, you know, pink area, just because it happens to be in, 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 the, in the water district, particularly since it doesn't feel particularly developed yet, uh, except for the possibility on the corner uh, where the patch in court was, you know, there's like an eight lot subdivision there, but it hasn't been built out in about 20 years. It probably will be eventually, but um, I don't want to re reinforce that. Yeah, I, 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 my two cents would be, I think Joel's right. The water district is not a good determinant of where the hamlet ought to be down there. Clear? Um, I think this map is is helpful, but it's clearly, I think, if I understand it, clearly just sort of a first stab to give us some general idea of, of how big the zones might be and where they are. And I'm finding this discussion um, not helpful because what's happening is that we're all, and I myself to some extent, but I'm okay with where I am, we're looking at where we are and what's happening around us and um, not um, trying to talk about what's best for Danby. I think what we should be doing is deciding, first of all, on the basis of this map, what, how we would like to handle the various things. And then ultimately we can discuss, you know, which, which zones particular pr properties should be in and, and why they are. If we, if we spend all this time talking about um, little little bits, uh, we're not going to get very far, and we're going to get, um, you know, we, we, everybody has their own their own ore to put in here on the basis of, of the fact that we all own properties. And um, but I think what we're trying to do here is come up with something that's best for Danby, and and I would like it if people could try and look at it from that perspective rather more than just how's this going to affect affect me personally. Thank you, Claire. That's a, a very important point. Um, and yeah. it was that kind of concern that 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 drove my um, somewhat different approach to the situation and, and prompted me to propose uh, uh, some sort of an alternative way of looking at it, because the uh, the, the the loss of rural character and the, and retention of rural character are. Are, are both important considerations. And I was, I, I, uh, to, I wasn't happy with, with the prospect of, of sort of conceding that some areas are already developed and then, and, and then enabling more of what we didn't want in the first place in those places. Uh, I'd rather, in fact, have a clear area where we want the growth to go. I almost have like an urban growth boundary could be a hamlet growth boundary where it's inside that area we encourage um, housing and we and we encourage density and outside of it we discourage density uh, and in particular we discourage sprawl and and what we lack is the flexibility in in in, in accommodating the development that that people are entitled to without uh, continuing the pattern of development that we had that has been resulting in the gradual loss of our character which is to say that the Landowners' equity lies primarily under our current rules in the road frontage, because you have to have road frontage to build. Uh, although you know you can get around it to, to, to some extent because it's not the, the the rules say you can have one lot for every five acres, but um, the reality is that you can't really have one lot for five acres because in order to access the back acreage you have to put in a road, and roads are very expensive, so the equity is mostly in the frontage. Now, if we don't want to just keep lining the road with houses, there has to be an alternative. And that's a really hard nut to crack. But so to me, you know, the two things that are important here. One, um, lower the density, because, you know, that you, if you if we actually build out what, a, a lot in time based on five acres, you would cover the entire town and the, the whole town would become one big subdivision. Nobody wants that. And so it, so the, what the, what's in with the entitlement in our existing zoning is completely inconsistent with the town's desire not to develop the low density zone. So we need to lower the density. Then we need flexibility in where the houses and where the lots are created in order to retain some of the open 
areas and, 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 and some of that road frontage. So I proposed uh, you know, a rather different way of looking at it. I, what I'd like to do is I'd like to try to retain some of the larger unbroken stretches, you know, the big fields, the forested tracks, um, the, the, by enabling the transfer of the rights, which might otherwise be exercised there someday, onto areas that are already developed uh, in a way that, that, that retains, when, it, it, when it's all built out, would still retain some rural character, even though we're accommodating some development. So we really don't want it there, but if it's going to happen, we need some flexibility in order to, to, in order to increase our chances of retaining some rural character, even when it gets built out. So um, can, we, can we turn to my suggestion at this point? Yeah, uh, I think it might be helpful before we do that, Joel, just to clarify that I think what you're proposing is that everything that is not the dark green color and not the hamlet is in one zone. So the medium green, the light green, and the pink are all in one zone, and that's what your your parameters are for. Is that a fair statement? Not necessarily. I mean, I don't think uh, it would be necessarily inconsistent to allow to have uh, a, a couple of colors of green. That that what I what I'm unhappy about is the pink. I mean, I would the pink would go away and turn it pro probably light green. So there'd be a light green, a medium green, and dark green. Um, I I think you know high priority, particularly particularly since we want we would want to treat the high priority conservation areas differently uh, than the than the you know the, the lesser lesser priority. Um, and I was thinking about this just before the meeting. And one way that you could you could do that would be to to um, make it so that well. well Maybe we should go over this because the, the key component here is the, is the possibility of transferring development rights from one property to another uh, in order to in order to give us some flexibility in order to encourage retention of, of unbroken tracts uh, and road frontage. So 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 I so these are my my uh, objectives here in the beginning. I was I was trying to retain some un, undeveloped road frontage. I was trying to give us the flexibility to integrate the development into the landscape so that we don't have people just creating lots because they get a certain amount of frontage but um, the lots get created in a way that allows you to 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 minimize the impact both aesthetic and and environmental and um and basically discourage development outside of the hamlet growth areas so the, the first objective would be change primarily by by decreasing the density so that so that the entitlement would, would be one dwelling unit for every 10 acres. Now there's a lot of, um, a lot of places in town where the lots are already smaller than 10 acres. And uh, you know, existing lots would be grandfathered in so that you would be entitled to at least one dwelling unit if you have a lot anywhere that was buildable today, you know, or, or when, before we passed the moratorium, it would still be buildable, but um, for all the ones that exist already, um, instead of being having a cap as we do now, where you're entitled to a one or two family house on a lot. And if you want to do anything different than that, you have to subdivide in order to create a new lot on which they would then have the entitlement for a one or two family house. Uh, instead of doing that, if we just say that, you know, that for every 10 acres, there is entitlement for one dwelling unit. If you have a smaller lot and you wanted to add a, a, a secondary um, dwelling unit to it, or even a not secondary dwelling unit, if you wanted to build a multi apartment building, for instance, um, you could do it by simply acquiring the right to do it by pulling it off of other land within the area. So, so the transfer development rights provision here is, 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 is rather important to, 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 to my approach. And it, it, I, I came to this after th thinking about it for a long time. Transfer development rights uh, has, I'm, I'm, correct me if I'm wrong, David, this is an idea that's been enabled in law for quite some time, but isn't being done anywhere in New York State? Uh, no, that's not correct. Um, the first half is correct. It's been enabled under law for quite a while. 
Um, there are places that do it. Um, it's, it's difficult and um, with the way, with New York State's town structure, what most often makes sense is for transfer of development rights to be intermunicipal and then it gets complicated because usually the sending area um, that's sending development rights to a more urban place, you know, wants a kickback for the tax increase that the more urban place is going to get from accepting those development rights. And when you have money going between municipalities, it can be complicated. Right. Um, and so, so basically, in order for TDR to work, you have to have a sending area. You have to have a receiving area where there is sufficient uh, desire to add more housing that the developers and property owners are willing to buy the rights from, from a sending area in order to increase the density in that, in that highly desirable area. It, where it doesn't work so well is in a place like Danby. We don't have a receiving area where we could say, well, of course, everybody's going to want to build here and we can transfer the development rights from the areas where we don't want them to build into those areas uh, as an incentive for them to do more. Uh, but uh, we, what we do have, and we would create uh, um, uh, by having a, a, a limit to the, to the, to the, the starting density um, at, at one dwelling unit for 10 acres, with then the ability to add more uh, within an area is essentially creating the sending and the receiving areas in the same area. What you're doing though, is you're, you're pulling the rights off of back acreage, which was less developable you know, without greater expense in order to enable more development in the, along the road frontage and off the road frontage you know, um, you know, within, within striking range, if you do a couple of other things, including um, making it easier to do private roads, not just easier, but less expensive to do private roads than our one road spec that we have currently, which is two I mean, it's, it's very expensive to do. So I have a, 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 a question for Joel. Um, how do you, I, I'm listening to the, what you're saying about transfer of development rights. Um, how do you respond to, the, to, to this concern? Uh, you might have, as you just talked about, you might have a, a moderately dense area somewhere. Someone wants to develop one of the parcels, purchases development rights, and turns what might be an otherwise fairly undense, I don't know, a sparse uh, neighborhood into one that might be well described as dense. Uh, how do you protect the other people who are living in the neighborhood from that? Um, two ways. Uh, one, I don't think see it as necessarily bad for- The neighbors uh, might. Well, well, you know, to have a, a, a dense cluster. Uh, and, and, and what I've got in here is the, um, is, and we haven't got through the whole thing here, but the, by, by having a 300 feet of separation between existing and new dwelling units would mean that if you had a new cluster, it would at least be 300 feet away. Uh, and if uh, three, I don't know, and, and you know, I just, I just used 300 feet and Ted, you probably know where this came from because you recall yes. that when, when we had the, uh, the uh, implementation task force of the comprehensive plan, we spent a lot of, we spent quite a bit of time thinking how far apart does it have to be in order to be regarded as separate. Um, and uh, that's 300 feet came up, it was the magic number that came out of that, which is why yeah. I stuck it in here. Maybe I should, do, maybe I should just cover the rest of the points there and then, and then so we can take some questions uh, about, about it. Yeah, I see Jess has had her hand up for a long time and then Corbett and then Claire. Yeah, do we want to take questions now or, and, and, and cause I probably, what the questions yes. will, okay. Jess had her hand yeah. up before we even started on this. Um, yeah, back ahead, before Jess. Joel started with his thing there, I just wanted to um, know more about what the, um, the, the, the light or medium green, the residential two, like what kind of restrictions are we talking about for that? Yeah. Thanks, Jess. That's a, a good question. And that I think that's something that we're we're still working on, but so far 
what the group had talked about is raising the minimum lot size or the, the average lot size to 10 acres per unit, where it's currently five acres per unit, um, which would keep it much, um, much more open. Uh, but uh, I think along with that, we were talking about ways of allowing that development to be um, concentrated, to move moved around the lot, to be incorporated in a, um, a multi-unit building or other things that can make it easier to access that amount of units um, while protecting more land at the same time. So trying to find that, that balance. Right. Um, so- you, you can say better than I because you're, you've, you've, the, who's got their hand up? Yeah, I've got the two screens going. So Corbett and then Claire. So I, I just wanted to point out that the um, framework that Joel is proposing is one way of adding value to the large lots. Because now instead of having to sell land off, um, to, in order to gain um, compensation for the value of your property, you can trade off development rights. And we haven't talked at all about how all of that would work. Um, but I think that's an attractive thing. And um, I'm, I just also, something happened to me in the last couple of days where I ran across an additional concept, which is the idea of uh, transfer tax. And in most cases, transfer tax is a tax that is paid by the <clears throat> seller to the municipality for um, uh, to build a fund for purchasing or mm -hmm. either rights or whatever for conservation. Mm -hmm. um, but it could be paid by the buyer. There's no, there's nothing preventing it from being paid by the buyer. So if a buyer buys a property, um, part of what they do is pay a tax to the town that is, can be used for conservation. And I just wanted to throw that out. Interesting idea. Um, was it clear? Yeah. So um, I have had a, a quick question about area because area seems like a really fuzzy thing and I have no idea what you mean um, by area um, or how you would define it and how you know how that would all work but I'm happy to wait until and we can discuss that after you've been through the whole thing I do just want to say that from a quick reading this this seems like a, a really interesting um, proposal that, that that seems much closer to perhaps something that that's going to end up doing what we want to do. I'm sure we'll need to do lots of tweaks to it, but um, I'm, I'm anxious to keep discussing it. Okay. So, um, uh, Joel? Yes? <clears throat> well, I got a bunch of, uh, you know, things that I would consider doing with it here, but they're not necessarily in, in any kind of priority order. Uh, so the the, the basic idea is you transfer development from one property to another within an area. And I was thinking, what I was thinking there was simply that I don't want to have it be anywhere to any place because if you did, if you, if, if, if say we're anywhere within a low density zone, what would happen is you'd end up transferring development rights from the south end of town into the north end of town, um, basically creating a, a sacrifice in the whole north end of town, which not what I want to do. So I, I, I would want to have it be more neighborhood than that, you know, like, you know, West Danby, you know, the Connington Road area, South Danby, North Danby, um, something like that. Alternatively, it could be simply a matter of, of within a certain distance. Half an hour ago. Um, for instance, I, mean, I was thinking about this just before tonight's meeting, because I was thinking, how would this work in, in conjunction with the different zones that, that David has on the map? And um, one thing that could be done you, you, in a high priority zone, you, for instance, you could transfer development rights out, but you couldn't transfer them in because we're trying to minimize development in that area. And then, and then maybe in the rural one, you could transfer them. Um, you could, you could, you could 
transfer them within uh, with, if, within a certain distance, and you could transfer them out. So, so they, could get, they, could, they could go out of the district, um, or they could be transferred within the area, you know, from, from the property that you're trying to acquire the rights um, to build more, you would have to be, acquire them within a mile, say. So, so that means just if you're in the north end of town and you wanted to acquire more, you'd have to acquire them within a mile, or you could get them from one of the high priority areas, uh, even if it's on the south end of town. Yeah. That's something to think about um, to answer, to address Claire's um, point. The, the, another provision here that I think is important is the, is the separation. Of, um, I would eliminate the road frontage requirement altogether because it would allow us to, well, because it gives you more flexibility. Uh, but um, in order to keep some, some up frontage open, uh, if, if, we, if we had a, a 300 feet of separation between existing and new dwelling units within 300 feet of the road, um, that would amount to saying that you have to have um, some space on the road frontage if it doesn't, if it, if it currently exists. Um, and, and, and my thinking here was that although on the map, it looks like there are some areas that are, are, are built up quite a bit. Uh, in fact, if you drive around, they don't all feel that way. And it's because in some places, the road frontage is not developed within 300 feet or more. And people have built long driveways and they built their houses back in and, uh, and it still feels rural. So, I mean, if we can keep some of that, particularly open fields, it's because it, it, it's easier to hide houses in the woods, but especially with open fields, if we can keep see a 300 feet minimum between existing and new, within that distance, it will, it will at least have some breaks along the road where you can look through to you know, undeveloped land beyond instead of lining the road with houses. Um, so you know, it's not without its difficulties of interpretation, but, but that's kind of what I thought maybe that would work. Um, uh, whether we want to do site plan review for everything, um, I, that would give us uh, that would solve the problem we currently have where lots are created, but at the time the lots created, the seller says, well, I don't really have an, I don't know what the buyer is going to put, where, where the buyer is going to build the house. So I just want to sell a lot. And then, and then uh, the planning board doesn't have any um, proposed dwelling to review at the time that the lot is created. But once the lot is created, then there's no further review. And you can go into the code enforcement office and get a building permit without, as long as you satisfy the front side and rear setbacks, you can put your house pretty much anywhere you want. And uh, that doesn't, whereas if you create a subdivision, you know, multiple lots, uh, it, it, it goes, it, you can get, get into great detail as we did with the Beardsley Lane and with the, with the um, Old Town Village and, and also with the Fieldstone Circle, you know, exactly where the houses are gonna be in a lot, there are building envelopes, where the wells are gonna go, where the septic systems are gonna go, um, you know, which trees are going to get left, you know, all that kind of stuff, exactly where the road goes, how the how, how drainage is going to be handled. But but we don't have that kind of review elsewise. And what we should have it is is when we when when the lots are created at all. But 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 I'm saying we, we should have it without work. You know, you, why should we have to have a lot created in order to add dwelling units? Why not make it possible to pull your dwelling units and create multiple apartment um, or multi-unit dwellings, the more we can put dwellings together in one building or a couple of buildings, instead of having them individual houses spread along the, across the landscape, the more we can reduce the, 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 the footprint, the, 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 um, of, of, you know, the impact on the environment. You, know, you, know, you can have fewer driveways, more retained open space. If you if you think about it, I mean, you could put the whole population of Danby in one high rise and look how much would be, you know, every, and then all the space would be left over. But we're not, we're not suggesting that. But instead of doing a limitation of you, you've got to have two acres and you can have you can have a one or two family house, why not just say you can have one unit for every ten acres? Uh, and if you don't have enough, if you want to if you want to build a ten unit apartment building, then why not? Um, you know, it, if you're going to do that, you're going to free up. Uh, you know, you're going to 
a hundred acres is where it will be un, un, someplace, a hundred acres is going, to, is going to be unbuilt in order to create that one 10 unit apartment building. And if we do that, I mean, if you, if you just think about building it out, you know, and, and, and if you stay within your neighborhood, it, you know, one unit for 10 acres is a fairly low density, but not an unreasonably low density, I don't think. Okay, so anyway, um, so we'd encourage clustering. Uh, it, 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 we could, we could, if we enabled private roads to basically to, to almost driveway specifications, that would minimize the cost and also minimize the environmental impact of the road instead of having this, you know, wide thing with paved and shoulders and ditches. Um, it could be, it could be much smaller which would make it possible then for, and feasible for, to say to a, a property owner, we don't want you to, to you've, got your, you've got all this road funds, but we don't really want the houses on the road funded. But, but, if you, but, but given that you've got 50 acres or whatever, I, we'd like to put the five housing lots over, over here on the edge and, and, and there's no minimum lot size. So they can be as, long, as, as small as possible. Or, or not, as as the as the market wills. You know, the, if if people are looking to buy five acre lots, then then that's what could be created. If people are, if 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 a, a bunch of people want to get together and create an eco village, where they buy a hundred acres, and if they do joint systems, they could have quarter acre lots and then an undeveloped balance. Or if somebody wanted to do a multi apartment um, building, they could they could pull the development rights from the property on, all into one building or, or acquire development rights from other properties in the neighborhood. Uh, so other things that, are, that it would be nice to, to, to not do is, is, is basically treat the location of the housing much as you would if you were doing a subdivision review using conservation subdivision principles, except here you're talking about the buildings and not, and not the lots. You know, so it would be best to have the lots not be on the class two soils. It'd be best not to have the buildings on the class two soils either. It'd be nice to have them clustered. Um, it'd be nice if we don't, if, it's, if we can't see them from the road. Uh, it's, it'd be nice if we have multiple units uh, and we don't block the view. And, and, and to the extent we can pull things off, we can, we can favor unbroken tracks. And so, so could you scroll up a little bit, David? No, I, no, I, I talked about like maybe how about a ten-unit apartment building? I don't know. Um, we don't have any provision for it now. Is it, is it, is it, is it reasonable to limit it to four dwelling units per building, or, or are we okay with the idea that they're saying instead of in the interest of promoting uh, conservation of remaining space, what? Would it be such a terrible thing to have a 10 unit apartment building? Uh, throwing that out there. Um, and we would, we could, as, as I said, you know, we could, we could encourage the transfer development rights out of high priority conservation areas and, um, and into areas where we're, it's already already developed or it's, it's, um, you know, an area where it's, where the property owners and the market you know, are, are want to put more housing. And, and of course, I, I had a narrative at the end that, that talked about how that would how that could all work. But um, I trust. Um, I think you've explained it pretty yeah, well. Questions. And I can explain it more. But yeah, I, I see Nancy has her hand up and so does Leslie. Yes. Um, Nancy first. Or? I I just wanted to say that from a um, building standpoint, if you put if you build a, a housing unit with more than two units in it, you have to have a sprinkler system. And it is possible to have a sprinkler system with well water, but to it's complicated, it's expensive. You have to have water storage, and um, it's expensive. You know so. That's why you're seeing these big units go up downtown because the, the economy is a scale. Yeah, um, right. You don't see people building many, any duplexes are fine, but you don't see fourplexes being built much anymore because of that, because of that requirement by New York State. It's actually uniform building law. So 
Anyway, that's all I wanted to say. Yeah, I didn't realize that because I, I I know there there are multiple apartment buildings being built in like Lansing and Dryden and so forth, and I didn't know that they're sprinkling. You can build them in the West Danby. Yes, because <laughs> we got water. <laughs> uh, Leslie. Um, am I unmuted? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I don't know. I, f I feel I'm a little confused. I'm not sure how to word this, <laughs> but um, I feel like uh, most people talked, decided that they, you know, were interested in having different expectations and requirements in different areas. Um, you know, an example might be, you know, Northern Danby is real different than uh, West Danby or South Danby. Um, and uh, so then density requirements should be maybe different uh, and lots of things. I, I just, I feel like, I feel like we were headed in a direction and now I just got yanked back into like the twilight zone. <laughs> but, you know, a lot of those things on, on that list are things when I look at your list, Joel, I think, well, yeah, we, we would in, you know, some of those things would be taken into consideration, you know, lot size, uh, setbacks, site plan, um, you know, but that they wouldn't, they wouldn't necessarily be the same everywhere. Um, and I know, you know, you might, you're distinguishing maybe the Hamlet core with the major low density, but it, it, even in the low density, there's there's differences and, and we haven't even really talked about riparian stuff. And I, I don't know, I, I feel like your whole list would be, most of it would be taken into consideration when figuring out what to do where, um, you know, parking, you know, setbacks, site plan, um, instead of, you know, having a one size sort of fits all. Um, well, it could certainly, I, I can't, you could certainly add granularity that way. I mean, the, the, the uh, you know, how the buildings get added could vary by zone. Because, you know, the, the critical I, thing- I assume, that's what was, I, th I assume that's where we were headed. Yeah, and so it's not- talk I don't, about that. Right. When we, I mean, there's a lot more to talk about, but but I I, I don't see that as incompatible. Um, with, in other words, I we could we could we could adjust. The question is whether or not it wouldn't be better to have the ability to to have flexibility in lot sizes, and also uh, the ability to transfer development rights, move them around in an area um, rather than rather than have them be just. Uh, having to be exercised in place, as it were. Uh, we, in theory, we have that now. But you know, what what ha the way yeah. it's supposed to work now is, if you if you wanted to access the back acreage, you'd have to put a road in because we require frontage on a road, and so does New York State. You know, the, it, New York State requires a whole lot less than we do. But but you know, given how many development rights are in the code now, um, you would say if you had a hundred acres, you'd be entitled to twenty lots. And you'd have to create a road in order to access them. And that, and our road spec, we have a, the, the one road spec, you know, it, it's so onerous that it makes it prohibitively expensive. But, but those, those are going to get worked on, right? I mean, we're going to, we're going to address the road stuff. Right, right, um, right. So, so we've got, right now we're treating one, it, we're treating it as if it were one size fits all and, and, and we're trying to get away from that. Uh, but um, so it, it seems reasonable to me, what you're suggesting seems reasonable to me, that we, we ought to be treating different areas differently. And, um, and, we've, and, and, we're, and, and that's sort of built in here by saying we have high priority conservation areas where we really don't want, we'd rather no development took place at all, but we're not willing to take people's mm -hmm. rights away. But if we make it easier for them to sell them to somebody else, someplace else, um, that would help oh, take... Yeah. Um, and wherever, wherever people want to add more, you know, more housing. 
It's likely already. But what if I mean zoned for that? Well, I mean, right, right, right now. Hopefully, hopefully, when the zoning got, hopefully, people would be able to add more zoning where we wanted it. Right. I mean, right. If yeah. if if we do this right, uh, people who want to do infill and and build up, you know, in the hamlets and those areas that it's decided that's where it would be best served, and then it depends on the study as far as septic and water and so you know. Yeah. Hopefully. Right. We wouldn't, you know, nobody would have to do that. I mean, yeah, but I'm, we're, I'm saying, I'm saying that we're going to do one thing in the hamlets, and it, and 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 something altogether different every place else. I mean, you know, in other words, uh, I wouldn't propose anything like this in the hamlet growth areas. That, that I, I would want to, I would want to maximize the density. Uh, almost like having an urban growth boundary, as I mentioned, you know, where 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 we want neighborhoods in at, at a density that's walkable. Um, mm -hmm. uh, you know, we're, we're talking about lots that are smaller than an acre, maybe a, you know, a quarter of an acre, or even less, um, where you have to have some sort of shared services in order to enable that, because otherwise you'd be right. looking at at at, at uh, you know minimum acre lots and that's not there's nothing hamlet like about that um so outside of that area what we're talking about here how do we divide up the low density zone into sub zones and, and well, I, the only thing that's like obvious so far that. <laughs> what's that i feel like that's what we've been doing yes exactly um maybe i could help focus a little bit um, good. <laughs> where, where i think I think there's a question that I think we need to answer in order to move forward. Um, and where that really comes down to the pink zones. And I think Joel has expressed his frustration um, with having a zone that continues to allow um, kind of the sprawl form um, that allows these smaller but not small lots um, that have developed and that really doesn't have a rural character that has a suburban character. Um, Ted uh, mentioned to me in the chat, and I, I think he's correct, that most of those areas, if you zoned them to a in a more restrictive zone, it might not even make a difference because they're already built out and they already can't be separated they're already... they're so small. Um, the, it's not universally true because the sizes that we had in there go up to lots that could be divided. Um, but a lot of them are, you know, as small as they can get already. Right. One of the reasons we talked about having such a zone, um, you know, I think we had said some things about, you know, it's already developed. Why bother trying to impose more restrictions? Um, but also, you know, there are people who live there um, because the lots are so small. There's actually a substantial portion of the town that lives in those areas. And there's something to be said for being able to tell a lot of people, don't worry, we're not changing anything for you. Um, so that's a, a political um, parameter. Um, and then there's also the, you know, if, if you, Say you have a three acre lot and you, you know, you don't want to make someone need a variance um, for expanding their house or, or other things like that. So um, I think that was a reason to stick with the current zoning. Um, but I think Joel also has some, some valid points of, you know, perhaps we, we don't want to continue having zoning in the town that allows this kind of sprawl. Um, if it's not a form that the town wants to see, if you have the political will that says we don't want more of this, we should not allow it, um, then you should consider if all of those pink things should just be the lighter green. Um, again, you, you don't get a lot from that because those lots are already developed. Um, so you're not stopping very much by putting a more restrictive rule on them. 
Um, but you may be stopping some things. There may be, there are some larger parcels in there um, that uh, could be subdivided, I think, under the existing rules. And um, that's a question of, if, is that something that you want to prevent? Um, and is it something that you have the will uh, to, to prevent if, if you do want to? Um, so I, I think that's an important question so that we have some clarity going forward. If we're going to talk about having the zone still or not, and you know, it's up to all of you. I don't have a strong opinion. I, um, I think I explained the reasons that uh, we talked about having it, um, but I, I yeah, don't I mean, have I, it. What I proposed wouldn't preclude you know, creating five acre lots with road frontage, mm -hmm. but it would make it less likely because you would have, a landowner would have the flexibility to divide up their land differently. Instead of having to have the frontage in order to create the lot, you, you still need frontage, but, but, but 25 feet is a whole lot different than 200 feet. And, and the 300 foot um, separation means that you wouldn't just be lining the road with houses. So where the lots already exist, it would allow, you know, an adding on, you know, accessory dwelling units while, and, and, and while doing it for these areas that are already built up, you'd be pulling development rights out of the undeveloped area, uh, lots in the area in order to, in order to accomplish it. So essentially the people who are there who want to make it denser would be paying to keep the rest of it less dense. And, and, and to me, that's kind of leveraging what we've already got that we didn't want in the first place um, in the interest of preserving some of the rest of it. I see Ted's hand. You're muted, Ted. So I am, so I was. You know, Joel, what you said there made, just made me think very quickly. Take a look, I'm just picking this one property at, at, at random, this, this guy here on uh, whatever road that is, Nelson. Mm -hmm. So you're saying that you could basically you're you're in you're in favor of a shared road, a shared driveway that you could build all the way to the back. And as long as you spaced the houses out 300 feet from each other, you, you, you basically no, they have a. They, no, they would not have to be spaced out 300 feet from each other. You, you, so if, if the 300 feet is, 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 a, is a separation from an existing house. You could cluster the houses any way that made sense for that property. So, so, so in a, so in effect, you, then you're saying that you, you're that that you're proposing, um, let's call it full length of the property, or even a cluster anywhere, uh, housing developments, as long as they're, uh, <laughs> as long as you can buy the development rights. Yeah, I mean, you would you would you would still do conservation instead of doing conservation subdivision, where in order to exercise your rights, you had to create lots in order to have, because you can only have two units in a lot. You have. I don't know how big that property is that you just you just pointed out, but I, I just picked it at random. Let me pick another uh, another couple of cuties. Whoop, those long strips. Um, yes. Okay. I mean, you could do some very interesting things out there. <laughs> uh, yeah. I'm not sure "interesting" is a positive word, but it might be. Yeah, I mean, you, you they, they, you know, idea how long, how, how many acres those are? Um, actually, I know. Um, Let's see. I'm going to change view so that they're, I... they're on the order of, of eight to ten acres. Okay, so if, if they are ten acres, then they've, they've they've only got one development right to start with. Right, they're just going to purchase more. Yeah, uh, right, they're, exactly. They're, they're a lot bigger than that, I think. I well, like uh, I from experience, I know that that um, uh, quadl that weird uh, truncated quadrilateral parcel just south of them where I used to live and that was six acres. Um, let me tap again and get the uh, drawing mechanism. Uh, whoop, where we go? <laughs> whoop, uh, scroll, can you move down a bit? Um, there. Um, this guy is six acres. This okay. bigger one is 18 acres. So these long ones, you're right. They could be. They could be the one dwelling unit unless they bought it in from someplace. 
they could even Longer put in ones are about 50. Yeah, okay, good. So you could put in a shared driveway from one road to the other and basically turn that area into the equivalent of the Yapel Road right above it. Maybe half as dense as Yapel Road. Maybe, but it, but essentially the same idea. Well, I mean, you can have it as dense as Yapel Road if you bought the development rights to do it. So, I mean, if you if you created a new road from one to the other, it's just a were, shared driveway, not even a road. Well, yes, I mean, you, you you call it a shared driveway. I mean, I'm talking about possibility of creating a, a road spec that would enable a, a, a essentially a shared driveway to be re regarded as a road. So, so it's basically a shared driveway because you have to have frontage on a road. Um, so it's private road, but but to put to a little more than the driveway spec. Yes, you could, you know, if you own that and from one road to the other road, you could run a road from one end to the other. And then you could and then you could um, divide it up into lots. Um, you would want you would you would want to use uh, the, and, the, and the planning um, board would, would would insist that you use conservation principles so that you avoid you know, quality soils and you, you and you avoid um, messing up the view um, and you and you, um, you know, cluster uh, where it's feasible. So you don't you don't have to create five acre lots. You, know, you, you would have to create probably if, if it's a realty subdivision, acre and a half lots, because that's as small as the health department will let you do. And probably in order to have both water and, and um, septic um, for each dwelling. But if, but if you wanted to do apartment houses instead of instead of single family homes or, or two family homes, um, you can have, although Nancy says you probably wouldn't be doing anything more than duplexes because otherwise you'd have to sprinkler. So you could do, you could do apartments, um, you could do, and they would be, they could be, it'd be up to the, the person who's doing it to, to um, determine whether or not they want to do um, sprinklers and put in a larger units mm -hmm. uh, could, and, could you and, and you could pull development rights between adjoining properties in order to create uh, you know a, 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 a new road that in there with 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 houses on them could, could you review what you, you you propose some limitations on transfer of development rights so you could move development rights into a dense area from a less dense area or from right. the same area right so, I mean, if you had a, a um, you could pull them out of, a, we'd have to think about, what, do we want to be able to pull out of, say, the Putrid Hollow and and have those development rights land over here uh, in order to enable higher density in, in this area and, and preserve the Putrid Hollow? Um, or do you want to, or would you want to keep it to this part of town where you were, where you might do a develop, you might do a, a cluster um, consider an eco village, you know, which would be like probably the ideal. You know, if you if you put, say, um, if how how big did you say these lots are, David? That's eight acres. How many? Yeah, 50. about fifty. About fifty. You know, if you if you, you know, so you got five development rights now. If you if you bought them in from adjoining properties, you could you could you could make the five ten or fifteen or twenty. And mm. um, and then if there was a if there was a shared system where for for septic you could have a you can have the kind of e uh, white hawk eco village type of clustering on 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 say on one end you know instead of instead of a road across from a to b but 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 there's some flexibility to do it in a variety of different ways one consequence of of, of an so so not all these things are connected but but the idea of of allowing the private roads at a lower specification is that it would open up possibilities that do not currently exist. Would you, would you ju just, just shooting from the hip, would you say that um, the kind of plan that you were just describing would be for ordinary citizens or basically for developers or interest groups like, like the Echo Village folks? I think you got, it's hard to predict, but I, you know, I can easily imagine um, you know, the, uh, there are this, we, we had this early in our planning process, you recall, there was somebody who was thinking about moving to Danby, you know, several people 
um, want to want to have a place together. That's how Ecoville got started in the first place. <coughs> and they they created a, a plan for for co-housing. Co-housing is one mo one model, but it's not the only one. Uh, what the market is in right now is for it's not for uh, low income housing on individual lots doesn't exist. I mean, almost no, almost no low income housing is being built unless it's subsidized. The market is either, it's mostly large lots where people buy their five acres, their seven acres, their 10 acres, and then they put the house in the middle of it. Or it's, uh, it's apartment buildings because of the, 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 the economics works out for doing that. And mostly those apartment buildings are, uh, are, are where they're, where they're municipal services, but not necessarily. Um, David pointed out to me that there's pretty good sized ones up in Lansing that are without the municipal services, but um, because of just economies of doing it that way. I don't, they must, if, if Nancy's right, David, those must be sprinklered. Yep. <laughs> Nancy's right. Anything, I think it's over three units. Um, is where you get sprinklers, but there's there's two levels of sprinklering. Um, residential things with small numbers of units can have cheap it's, plastic it's pipe sprinklers, oh, and um, it, when you get a bigger building and you have to go to metal, it gets a lot more expensive. Um, but I don't think it's something that we need to worry about. If it's allowed and it makes financial sense, somebody will do it, and if it doesn't make financial sense, they won't do it. No, so we're, really we're speculating here, though, on what's likely to happen, um, and it's really hard to say. Uh, but we would be opening up more. We, we'd be doing two things: we'd be reducing the overall potential by lowering the density, but by increasing the flexibility, we'd be opening the door to kinds of development that we haven't seen. You know, what we, what we have been seeing is lot by lot lining the roads. And that's because of the way our, our, our current regulations are structured. You have to have the frontage, although you can get a variance because you're entitled to more than, than the frontage will give you. And, and you have to have the acreage. But um, functionally, the way things are, you, know, you can't practically get at the back acreage because of the, 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 the road frontage requirement. You, unless you're- for, for, for what it's worth, I do see uh, th I do think that we should be careful um, if we end up protecting against the potential of the worst while guaranteeing the for sure development of a different kind. Yeah. yeah there's, there's there, no you have to strike there. a balance. Yeah, yeah. I agree. I mean, uh, that's also known as losing the battle, uh, losing the war, but winning the battle, but losing the war. Yeah, right. Well, I was talking to David about this the other day, and he said, you know, it, it has the potential uh, to actually increase the amount of development that we get, at least in the short term, because we'll make it easier to create lots in areas where, you know, the frontage is already mostly used up. Yes. Yeah, but, um, but, but by limiting the overall density, uh, where the, the the end result is is rather different than 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 what we would get under the current rules. With with, with we'd be going think about this. We're not really going from one one dwelling unit for five acres to one dwelling unit for ten acres. We're going from a one or two family, which is two dwelling units per lot, where the lots are one for every two hundred feet. And what that translates to is, is actually two acres, not five, along the roads. And so that you're entitled to essentially one dwelling unit per acre along the roads. That, that is, one dwelling unit per acre is rather different than one dwelling unit per 10 acres. That, that is true, but it sort of frightens me to think of 10 years of very rapid development followed by <laughs> none, <laughs> so shall we say. The mm -hmm. 10 years would be tough. Well, I mean, if the kind of development we get are, it, it will make it possible to create smaller lots. 
um, in clusters with, uh, with, a, with a road spec that would be you know, doable, uh, that might help affordability. Uh, whereas you know, driving it with large lots does the opposite. It would it would it would make them. It would mean we have mostly high upscale development, which is what we have been mostly getting in recent years. So if I mean, and, and of course that raises a whole issue. Do we want to make it possible to do affordable housing in the in the in the in the low density parts of the town, so quote unquote low density parts of the town? As opposed to um, in the hamlets, I don't know. I mean, you know, it, 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 if you think about it from the from the environmental impact of it, you know, having having apartment buildings and even clustered housing uh, sprawled all over the landscape uh, is is in an if inefficient uh, in, in terms of uh, you know dry, having to drive to everything and 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 it, you know it's difficult to provide services requires a lot more road upkeep, um, you know, everything's more expensive if you sprawl as opposed to clustering it in, in, the, in, in the hamlet growth areas where you can, uh, you know, transportation becomes, you know, whether it's, whether it's bus transportation or carpooling, uh, provision of services, you know, the, the, the amount of road for the number of houses that are being serviced, uh, you know, everything is cheaper if you do it that way. You know, let, if not to monop not to monopolize the conversation, but let me put together two things we just talked about. I kept saying, well, that that parcel over there could uh, end up with five or or that that guy or that guy could end up with five or ten houses on it. Uh, and you started talking about appropriate road spec. Well, by the time you get to five or ten houses, uh, wouldn't the appropriate road spec be exactly what we have now? Um. I did think about that, although I didn't put it in here. And we, 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 what we want to do with our road specs is we probably want to say, you know, you can have a sh essentially a shared driveway for accessing, let's say, four dwelling units. Um, but beyond that, you have to go to a, a higher road spec. You know, maybe, maybe the pay, maybe the the width increases from 12 feet to 16 feet or something like that. Um, you know, it doesn't have to be. Uh, and 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 even the and then there's the landlocked properties of which there are not too many, but a landlocked property um, we might uh, we we might want to access from from uh, using an open development area, but with a, with a, with that but not allowing the density to be increased there. So so you know you're entitled to you're entitled to your, to one for every ten, but. And you might even want to reduce it, you know, below ten for for those for those landlocked properties. I think we're at we're we're raising more questions than we're answering. Than we're answering, right? Nancy's got her hand up. Nancy. Hi. Um, so, Jill, this is very interesting. And there's a lot of interesting aspects of it, but do you have any idea whether it's been done anywhere before, anywhere that you know of, this kind of approach to development? I do not. <laughs> Other um, states have done it. What? Okay. I said other states Central have done development it. development rate is nothing new. I studied it in college. 40 years ago, so other states have done it. Yeah, yeah. I mean, what's what's different is that it, it's typically done with a with a sending area and a receiving area. Well, what's different here is 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 having the sending and receiving basically in the same place. You're basically moving from adjoining properties, you know, one property to another property in the same neighborhood instead of moving it to some place else. Is some other municipality? For example, yeah, or even within a municipality. I mean, if we were so if we were so lucky as to have our hamlet centers be highly desirable places to live, where their developers were clambering to to build more housing, um, and we could then make that a receiving area, we could we could say, well, we you 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 can increase your density by by buying development rights from our from our high priority conservation areas and move them in so you can build more houses. But we don't have that luxury. We have we have the opposite situation where. 
I was told um, by, by, by Jim Havanek years ago when I asked him, you know, why not build in the hamlets? And he told me because uh, nobody wants to live there. In, there's, it's, 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 there's, there's already, you know, what's there is already is run down. You know, you're, you're going to devalue the houses that you build. Uh, you, so it makes more sense to, to do greenfield development uh, outside the hamlets than it does to build in the hamlets. We're going to have to create an incentive to people to build houses in the hamlets. We're not going to be able to, we, rather than, uh, rather than um, having it be highly desirable where we could transfer rights in because people want it, are clamoring to build more, we're going to have to make it easier, much easier to build in the hamlets than outside of the hamlets in order for it to happen at all. Um, so when the other, I had a couple other questions. I, well, my main one is this kind of concept, like right now when we buy our property, we, it's based on road frontage, whatever. We know that the property next door isn't going to be able to buy development rights and go up for sale and then change the whole character of where, say, I'll, personally, I'll just use me where I live, right? And it just, if it, and I'm everybody, right? That it, 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 so how do, I guess my question is, how do um, adjacent property owners have any kind of, you know, I guess you could use the word protection or uh, that the rural character they have right now is um, more or less, you know, going to stay the way it is. I, I don't know if I'm, I'm asking this question in the right way. I hope you can understand what I'm trying to say. Well, what, what, what I hear from you, and, and correct me if I'm wrong, is, is, is misgivings about how the character might change if we change the rules. Um, if what? If we change the rules from what we have now. Uh, yeah, but, it's a little scary. Well, yeah, except it's that. What's, what's even scarier is what's possible within the rules currently. Well, true. Yeah. Well, that's why we're having all this. Yeah. I mean, know, right now, it, you know, if, if you understand. if you own 100 acres right now, you're entitled to 20 lots. And that pretty much messes up. I mean, it is possible to do clustering with, with at, at the five acre density so that you've got some retained open space. But well, that, that, take, that takes us back to the question I asked earlier. With the transfer of development rights, in fact, things become less predictable in a given neighborhood. That's correct. I would I say that that's what I'm worried about, the unpredictability of it. That's a good word, Ted. I, I, I think that's incorrect, though. Um, things uh -huh. become more predictable in the neighborhood. They become less predictable on an individual lot. But what you've done is cut the total development potential in the neighborhood by a quarter. You cut out a quarter of the total development potential of the neighborhood. Now, an individual lot maybe could get twice the development that it could get before, but it's preserving a huge amount of space. Um, and under what Joel's proposed, that space is in that neighborhood. So, um, so hey, again, you have, you have less change um, except it will be more concentrated. Well, you're, you're correct on the assumption that it's only one individual that becomes the recipient of development rights. You, you, you could have someone who buys up several properties in that, in that same neighborhood and transfers all sorts of development rights. So you're, every, every plus can the be- The amount can be, of development rights is capped. So, and reduce. So the amount of development rights now, there's only a quarter of that development rights allowed under the new, under the pro Joel's proposed program. Um, so there's less development yes. rights. Yes, yeah. yes, yes. But realistically, I mean, I, we, over the last few months, we've heard, we've heard similar arguments where something bad is potentially justified by saying the absolute worst case of the rules that we have now is, but the absolute worst case doesn't happen very, very often. Whereas in this case, we're creating a situation where it could. Yes, but what, what we have to look at what's the probability that it would happen there either. Um, it would be, it would be much easier to build in the hamlets 
which is what we want, which we say we're, we're making, we're trying to make it easier to build in Hamlet, harder to build elsewhere, but without taking the right away. You know, so I, 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 I'd, I'd like to reduce the density and then, and then add flexibility so that we have the ability to not just line the roads with houses, but put the houses where the, where it makes sense in the landscape, you know, integrate them into the into the Nicole, landscape. There's a there's a solution to this. Why not put in that TDRs have to be approved by the uh, planning board or town board or whichever board you want to put in there. That that needs to be needs to be approved. Then then it couldn't happen where somebody could go buy 500 acres right next to 10 or some other part of town that we don't like uh, development and make a mini Ithaca right there by taking all the TDRs and putting them right next to somebody who wouldn't want it. What about Remember, that? Remember, it's me, it's me and you who's gonna sell off the 25 development rights, not the other way around. <laughs> <laughs> and that that could be dangerous for some people. Well, um, I, 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 that's, that's an interesting thought. Russ and and I wonder whether David, you you have um, any sense for whether or not that would be a, a, a legally sustainable thing to do. So the the normal way of doing TDR programs is that the town board sets up the receiving areas, and you only create new receiving areas by action of the town board. Uh -huh. um, so. I think what Joel was proposing is a more flexible thing where, um, you know, you don't, because we don't, aren't going to have a receiving area. I mean, unless the town was ready to invest in more infrastructure for the hamlet, um, it, it's not as easy to say all of our development potential should be put here because we don't have the infrastructure for it. Um, so his scenario would allow, um, Actually, some some relief to a lot of people who um, contacted me. You know, one of the kind of saddest calls that I frequently get is, you know, my twenty or thirty year old kid can't afford a lot, and I want to allow them to build on my lot. And most of the time, I have to tell them your lot's not subdividable. Um, you know, you can maybe get a special permit for a second house on the lot, but you, a lot of times they don't have the room. If they could go see Ted or Russ and say, you know, I'll give you $10,000 for a development, right? And then, you know, they can put that second or third house on their lot. Um, that preserves, you know, 10 acres on one of the lots where we, where somebody doesn't, really want to develop anyway, but it protects it permanently. Uh, actually, I should qualify that. It protects it until the town board changes the zoning rules. Um, Good point, but the, another point would be if they couldn't have built there in the first place, which is what we've decided, should we? Should, should I be able to sell him that right? I, I, I'm not sure I should. In most of those cases, there's no physical problem. You know, it's not a restraint of the suitability of the land. It's just or the health department that area. Mm -hmm. So if if instead of you know, I told someone uh, a couple of weeks ago, you know, she said, "Can I can I put the second house on my lot? It's a, a lot that's long and skinny along the road." And I said, "No, you can't. You don't have enough acreage." Um, to you to do that subdivision, you you have to have ten acres to be able to have two lots um, under the current rules. Um, and she said, "Oh well, can I buy this lot that's farther up the street?" Well, yeah, you can. You could buy that and ha build a house there. But if you're going to do that, why not just put it on the lot that you already own? If you could just buy the development rights. Um, and protect that other lot instead of spreading out the development more. It has some merit to it. What I, what I anticipate would be that the, 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 the highest demand is going to be where it's, the town has already developed, which is to say mostly in the north end, because that's where, um, that's what would happen in absent any zoning at all. You know, it would, it would fill in from the north. And 
here we're limiting how much it can fill in, but we're, we're giving, we're, but we're enabling the density where it's already developed to increase. And at the same time, we're, we're, we're moving to protect that which is currently undeveloped um, so that less and less of it becomes developable. You, know, you would transfer development rights from the back acreage essentially to the already developed lots. And you could create some new ones, but, but you don't have to. Um, I want to jump in with um, a comment that uh, Brad put in the chat, and I think it's a, a good point and um, something that I think also has been addressed in a way. So Brad said, um, can we increase the setbacks on all sides for lots that acquire development rights and would buffering neighbors um, help with the increased clustering density? And um, I think that is a good idea. And I also think that that's kind of what uh, Joel is saying with the 300 foot rule, that if you want to put a cluster um, or even just one um, house on a new lot, it has to be at least 300 feet from um, any of the neighboring houses, which we kind of get already with uh, close to with the minimum 200 foot road frontage for a subdivided lot. Um, but it doesn't always work out exactly that way. So 300 is more. And, you know, just requiring the road frontage, you could end up with one house that's on the east end of the lot and the other house is on the west end of the lot and they end up pretty close to each other. So that I think that 300 foot separation does some of that. I think increasing side setbacks as development rights are acquired is another, another way to skin that cat. We skin cats here. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the other thing about the 300 feet, it would, it would also keep somebody from building a house right behind you, which has been an issue for some people. Um, you know, you, mm -hmm. you've got, um, you would have to be at least 300 feet away. How, how does, uh, this is a David question, if you had that 300 foot thing, um, it means that the position of my house on my lot affects the ability of my neighbor to build a house. Mm -hmm. um, what's the legal status there? I think like everything in zoning, there has to be a relief valve. There's the ability to go to the BZA for special circumstances, but with the size of our lots, I, I don't see it really being a substantial barrier. Um, and Brad, you look like you've been ready to jump in. So I want to turn it over to you if you have something to say. Yeah, hi everybody. I'm sort of new to the group. So um, uh, we we're going to do introductions early. So oh, that's totally my, that's my it, <laughs> yeah, we sort of slid in there, but it's fine. Um, so yeah, so the 300 foot, I'm wondering if we could sort of um, customize that too. Like, is there value in that? So 300 foot standard from another dwelling, but you know, what if it's from the property line and then as you acquire more development rights, you know, that maybe tightens up, right? So you have a, a tighter density as you acquire more development rights. So, you know, to Ted's point, do we want a whole, you know, subdivision? Do we want Ithaca coming out and heading to South Danby or something, right? So um, that would sort of tighten that up and buffer the neighbors in the maybe the zones two or one or whatever. Right? Yeah, it was mm. not my intention to 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 require that any additional dwellings be 300 feet apart. Only that there be 300 feet between what's currently existing and any <clears> new <throat> ones. So when you could create, you know, whatever you're adding, that they, they don't have to be 300 feet from each other. They could be much closer. In fact, I suggested. Um, 300 feet on the same lot, Joel. I mean, yeah, I, no, yeah. No. What, I, what I what I was saying, Joel, was not from another dwelling, but from the proper the neighboring property lines. So the actual setback. So it, it the legal question that Ted asked was, you know, if somebody builds right up to the edge, then they're sort of pushing somebody else into their lot. So if you just make the property line the buffer, and then they can acquire more development rights, but the more they acquire, the farther they have to be from their property line, you know, in, in on the interior, right? So it forces tighter development and then they eventually they hit a limit, right? Because you could limit the, the size of that. How's that differ hmm. from setbacks? Um, 
it, it doesn't it just it just scales it based on the mm. extra acquired development that you desire right so if right. you had somebody those lots you pointed out ted that had were 50 acres right if the the more that they acquire the farther in interior they have to go and the, the tighter mm. the cluster has to become mm -hmm. until finally just, they meet some may, maybe they hit a, an upper limit yeah 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 just to clear up what what joel and i did a quick back and forth on there so if today house a sits house b what you're saying can uh cannot build within 300 feet of it but once house b is built can some house C on another lot, does it, does house B get considered in those 300 feet? It has to, <laughs> or does it? No, it doesn't. I mean, what's to. the point? Then what's the point of it? Just to protect people who are living here today and not protect people who build a house in the future? Well, the, the, the point of it was to not require sprawl, you know, no, 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 to have big, these big separations between buildings already and to enable uh, on a property, you know, the, the, the houses to be put fairly close together. Well, uh, I you, think you, you might, but then, you know, to Brad's point, it might make sense to have some sort of, you know, separation from the property lines so that, so that subsequent, um, you know, ones were, were, were or not. If I built my house on my property line, it doesn't affect the fact of what my neighbor can do. His setback always goes from his property line, not my house. That that's right. what Brad is that right, Brad? Yeah, yeah. I mean, which is what the way setbacks normally work. You know, usually from property lines. Yeah, and so I I think currently, and correct me if I'm wrong, I'm sort of new to the I'm, I'm figuring out all the the rules here, but aren't they on the sides and the back? something like 10 feet or something. Well, no, they're more than that. It's, right, it's, so. It's, it's, that's the thing, it's, it's, it's was it 50 foot, 50 foot side, no, 70, 75 50 rear? foot, so yes, depends on the zone, yes. Yeah, yeah, and, yeah. Then, and then in the, um, but I think outbuildings can maybe be 10 foot or something, right? Yeah, so, right, right. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, Is he gonna his hand up for a while? Oh, sorry, Brad, if I jumped on you, if you had more to say, go ahead and. Nope. No, okay. I think there are ideas out there, so. Toby? Uh, I just wondered uh, what, would existing conservation easements be a source of development rights? No, uh, how they're would, already gone. <laughs> they're already gone, okay, so you, you give up development rights. Yeah. And just the whole administration of the, these development rights is, sounds pretty complex, but I guess that would all get have to get worked out in the zoning <laughs> I mean, we attempted we attempted something like this in theory we're already doing it you know, where we 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 do not require five acre lots but you're entitled to one lot for every five acres uh under under and so if you had a hundred acres and you were going to do a subdivision you would you'd be entitled to 20 lots that wouldn't have to be five acre lots and they typically would not be um, and, the re and, the, and the leftover space, so to speak, once you created your lot is no longer developable. We have to keep track of that. Um, but but uh, the reality- We haven't we, been, have we? Well, we haven't, we haven't. I mean, we, 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 the, 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 to, as far as I know, we've been assuming that when somebody carves off a five acre lot that they've got, that that's one development right. Um, for these two acre lots that have been created, most of the time they're being created where, you know, they weren't carved out of a much bigger piece. And so it hasn't mattered. It had, it, it, you, you could figure it either way and it, would, it doesn't change anything. But, but, in, but, in, but in theory, it, it, it could make a difference, but we haven't been very good at keeping track. But, so you have to, we would have to track. If we're, gonna, if we're gonna be saying it's not lot size, but density that matters, you know, we're, we're not saying you have to have 10 acre lots. We're saying you can have one lot for every 10 acres, and it could be a one acre lot um, or less, then you have to have some way of saying, well, okay, if you do that, then if you start out with hundred acres and, you've, and, you, and you, you, you've got your nine, you've got your 10 development rights, uh, you're, you have to track. 
you know, if, particularly if you start selling them to somebody else, you know, now you don't have 10, you got nine or eight, you know, um, somebody else has got not 10, but 12, you know, um, if they're, if they got a hundred acres or if they got the one acres, now they've got two instead of one, you know. Um, so yeah, we have to keep track. And uh, maybe David, you could speak to how one would do that. Cause I think you have um, given that some thought. Yeah, and um, Russ just put it in the chat, but uh, actually what I would suggest is not on the deed, but on the plat, on the subdivision plat that you note it there. Um, and then, you know, also it would be smart to be tracking it in our GIS. Um, I think that I'm working on getting the town's um, GIS data into a system that's more operationally useful rather than just making maps from now and again, um, but that's currently not not where we are, but it would be very useful. Um, it would, particularly if we don't require subdivision in order to exercise the rights. Yep, yeah. Um, and uh, with that, I, I think we're, we're kind of getting to the end of our time here, um, and we should think about think about wrapping up and think about what I'm going to do to get back to you, um, because I, I don't think we really answered the burning question here, um, mm -hmm. which is, do we want a suburban neighborhood zone? Do you want a zone that allows the kind of stuff that's happened already? Um, you know, we could, if we're going to have that, you know, the lots that are in it is always tweakable going forward, but um, do we want to have that or do we not want to have that and not have any areas where the zoning isn't changing? And you also really haven't answered the three questions that you posed at the bottom of the map. I, so I feel like we did, there was definitely a consensus on the first question um, that the West Ambi Hamlet does not include parcels south of Sylvan Road or Lane. Okay. Um, if anyone disagrees with that, chime in. But it it sounded that's the feedback I got before this meeting from people who live there, and that's all of the feedback that people who had something to say said here. Um, as far as the other ones, I think you know we had some tinkering. We had people say move this lot, move that lot, um, and that will continue continue to be ongoing so it might be worth thinking about whether or not you know if we if we put tdr into the mix whether that changes people's opinions about the zones uh, because for instance as I, as I mentioned before one could say that for a high priority zone you know the, the, the you know the darkest green that you can transfer out but you can't transfer in with development rights yep i think that's certainly on on the table so uh clear Oh, I've been waiting so long, I can't remember what I was going to say. Um, oh, I know what it was. Um, the suburban character thing and Joel's concern about mm -hmm. turning suburban areas that we don't like and growing them. Um, I was wondering if we could just cut down on the number of suburban areas that we have and, and just restrict them to areas that we, that we think should be suburban. And I, I sort of got the impression that Joel was thinking that that the north part, which is close to Ithaca, um, is where it's likely to become um, suburban. And if we think um, that those areas, it's reasonable to have them as pink ones, um, then do it. But then, but don't necessarily do it um, on Steam Mill Road. And then I don't know what the one, Trayvon Road. Yeah. yeah, I mean, that don't, don't do it there. I mean, just, just cut down on those and do them according to areas that we think should be suburban rather than ones that are and we don't like them. Uh, for what it's worth, I, 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 don't, I, I, I don't think we should be anywhere. That's, a, that's my problem. <laughs> <laughs> uh, I asked David a question privately. Um, if you define the north of Danby as, let's call it, where that bulk of the pink is and north, mm -hmm. I'm not sure that there are a lot of subdividable places realistically. The big ones that I see are, are, are the Montessori school, for example. There isn't a lot of subdividable area up there. So That's then, on a road. So That's then on just, a road. Yeah. So then just leaving it as is or, or, 
or whatever. Well, that would, would I'm not. Work. I'm not saying forget it, but I'm just pointing out that the North isn't doesn't have a big future in subdivision on a although, road. If, although, if Put you reduce your, if you do reduce your, um, if you if you if you have no minimum lot size and only 25 foot frontage requirement. Um, a lot of those existing lots could be subdivided if, if one wanted to. And also if you're not limited to one or two family on a lot, um, some of those bigger lots, is, there's room for you know, an apartment in the back or, or even a duplex in the back, adding more units on a lot you know, without subdividing. With transfer development rights. Right. Which is what I think would probably happen, but, um, but, but it would happen in a, in, while simultaneously making less likely that the, that the, the bigger lots that are undeveloped uh, in the same area would be retained in an undeveloped form rather than having at some point in time somebody put a road in and carving it all up. <laughs> So maybe we need to think more on the question of if, if there is a retained zone where the zoning doesn't change because it's already built out. Built out. Um, Joel, I'm not sure if the argument you were just making is an argument in favor of changing to this other system that would allow more development in these in these areas than is allowed under the current zoning. Well, it, it's it, what it is, is, is it, it overall in the area, a lot less than is currently allowed. But mm -hmm. what it would allow is denser, uh, denser in, in part. So it would, it, 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 it might produce a different result than our current rules. So, so I, I guess I have a problem with saying the current rules are where we ought to be uh, uh, keeping in place any place because the current rules got us into this mess in the first place. And it, it, I, would, I would rather have said, let's, it would have been better to develop in a different way, but we can't undo what's already there, but we can undo what's already there in a sense by, by changing the rules so that you know, we're not keeping the rules the same if we, if we do something like I suggest, we're making it possible for the character of the area to change a little bit more in some respects, but also make it more likely that the that the rural feel of parts of those places where the, you know the larger lots would be retained in the long run, rather than end up being part of the continuing the pattern of you know, lot by lot along the road that we that we've been seeing. And is it going to be better? Well, it, it's worth thinking about because it it, it would be different. All right, so maybe with that said, it doesn't sound like we have a lot of uh, feedback from other people about that and we are um, over time. So maybe that's something to think about before the next meeting in two weeks. Yeah, it would be nice. Um, I, I, I'm not sure it wouldn't be worth having a dialogue about this you know, by email in between, which we've sort of curtailed in, in you know in recent times because in the interest of having the discussion at the meeting but um, but it's hard to then if, you know have the thinking evolve between meetings if you don't if you don't have an opportunity to interact with other people but I'm not I'm not sure we can do that Joel because um, our group isn't stable well it's true and you don't want to and it certainly wouldn't want to involve everybody into dialogue that would people would drop out yeah. I think we're having so many meetings that waiting two weeks yeah. to talk about this again is probably. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. As long as, as long as we I think we have the leisure to do it that way. Yeah. Nancy. Um, so Jill, I hear what you're saying about having some kind of continued dialogue because um, it just when people start thinking about this and questions come. Uh, raise and they want to interact with people and 
Um, I, maybe Facebook might be a place to kind of put this up there and to see what on the Facebook page for DMB, you see kind of response you got. We had an interesting dialogue going about the, you know, the conversation about the I presenting, you know, having the town board talk about a noise ordinance. I like to think about it as a quiet ordinance, but anyway. Uh -huh. <laughs> um, um, I, I mean, people had chances to really say how they felt about it, and there was different opinions about it, and I thought it was really healthy. And mm -hmm. unfortunately, it's only one of the, the few places where you can have really an open public dialogue. I don't know if it's appropriate for this, but it's just an idea. So, how about, how about, a, how about a Google group? They're much, they're, they're very easy to set up. Oh, yeah, maybe. Yeah. But it's very then how good. do people reach people that are not coming to the meetings? Like that's my concern. As soon as um, as soon as somebody uh, as soon as somebody shows interest, they just join the group, make an announcement that it's out there. Well, you could put that on Facebook, right? That yeah. would be a good yeah. way to do it. Well, announce it somehow. Yeah. yeah. Cool. Yeah. Well, how would that happen? Mm. How would that happen? If you want it, I can do it in about 10 minutes. A Google group? Yeah. So you're just talking about what's called a listserv and it's just a forum where people put stuff yeah. out there. And, and you don't, and you don't have to listening. keep track of 50 email addresses. Catherine has her hand up. Yeah, I would be really uncomfortable if this went to the Danby South Hill Facebook page. I, I'm uncomfortable with this. This should be specific. Anything like this should not, it's, should be specific and people can come to it who are interested in Danby and concerned about all this, but it isn't a Danby South Hill issue. And there is a certain amount of um, background that is useful and guidance that to keep conversations from going completely off the rails. Um, because I think we've seen that too in mm -hmm. email threads. It's really easy for that to happen. And there's also open meetings, um, implications, open meetings law implications of having a quorum of town board people um, in an email thread that's not uh, part of the public record, which is why mm -hmm. we've been trying to focus the discussion in, in these meetings. And we are having a lot of meetings. We have three more meetings to um, discuss the parameters of the zones before we send a first draft to the town board. So um, that's six more hours of <laughs> this conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> that I hope is enough. Um, yeah. I, I yeah the, the, the number of um, twice a month meetings we have before deadline, your deadlines are calling for um, results is not that many. No, it's true. There's a lot to accomplish here. In, uh, but if we can get if we can get a framework that people are mostly bought into, then then David could do a lot of the what I call the grunt work. Yeah. So when you, um, sorry, I'm gonna jump in here. I hope you don't mind. When you present something to the public or town board or whatever, can it be options? Like, could this be an option that, that could be talked about versus? The other option, which would, which is all the different colors maps, you know, and try to have some input from the public about that, or do you think that's too confusing? Well, I mean, it, it, there's something to be said for doing that, but there's also the risk. The, the there's also the, uh, and there's a risk in 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 going to route of trying to arrive at a sort of a group consensus of what we ought to have happened and then taking it to town board and find out that that's not what they want to entertain. So um, there's a risk either way, really. Yeah, I, I mean, I think we need to evaluate things as this group, that's our job is to narrow down ideas to bring something to the town board and to get an adopted zoning in nine months, we can't write three codes um, no, we're gonna, we, we're, what we, what we can do is we can we can take them and say here's here's kind here's what we're thinking is that is that are we on the right track? Yeah, which is why we have an extra town board meeting every month to go over that information with them. Yeah. So I I do want to be 
conscious of people's times and be respectful. We're we're getting yes. up to fifteen minutes past the end. Right, right. Yeah. I um, just a real quick thing. When is the next town board meeting about this? The town board next town board meeting is next Monday, the tenth. And that's when you're no, talking the, about the special town board meeting. Is this oh, Monday? the next special one? The next special one will be the seventeenth. Right. The difficult is that the town board meetings are not open forums for us to actually exchange ideas with each other. Right, it's more for uh, more of a right. So that's the direction to town board. Yeah, that's what the four meetings a month of the working groups are for. I mean, they're not. It's not like a. There'll be more opportunity than a regular town board meeting for. People to participate. In. I mean, sure, if there's discussions, you know, the advocates of particular um, um, perspectives would be up, to have an opportunity to chime in. Yeah. Pat Pat Woodworth had a hand up sometime. There was something you want to say, Pat? Oh, I was just going to note that um, putting something on Facebook is not a particularly good idea. Not everybody is on Facebook, and people that are on it have been on it, have gotten off because it's not such a good uh, forum to be on. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because you don't, people don't have, don't have complete information to have a discussion. All okay. right. So there's still the opportunity for, you know, we know who we are, most of us know who we are here, um, to have some discussion, you know, by email. If, uh, if people have questions about, you know, what David proposed, what I proposed, obviously, um, I'd like to hear people's people's feedback, and, and we can we can, you know, have that in mind as we as we as we come around to the next meeting, and maybe we can have a little bit of of, of, of exploration of the implications and and how how one might modify these things in order to make them work. Uh, if you're doing it by email, though, then you're going to be excluding people unless you have them all on the same list, which you know, I, I don't mean to be obnoxious, but the list serve. I, I would suggest you try it for two weeks, see how it works. And it's not a thing that anybody's going to be controlling. We're just brainstorming and putting ideas up there to save our time so we're not spending as much time in this forum. I, I like it, Kim, and it would be my preference, but the uh, the, the, the problem is the the, the open meetings law constraints? Well, then just uh, the town board should not participate in that. Yeah, but it's not just the town board, it's also the planning board and it's... and it's. it's yeah, we don't, do we have any planning board people here tonight? Um, do we not have any planning board people? We have Claire, we have yes. Toby. Well, Claire's CAC. I know, I'm just pointing out who is here. Yes, right. We've got, and we, we, we do not have a quorum of the town board. Yeah. But um, but these meetings have the potential to have a, a, a you know a, 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 a majority of any of any one in one of these participating boards, which is one of the reasons we committed in the beginning to have them be publicly public meetings. They're they're, they're noticed give, and, and they're they're all in the calendar. People can come if they want to. They know they're happening. So if they want to observe. Um, the discussion and the, and the deliberations, they can they can come and, and, and observe it. You take it offline and put it on a, on a listserv and um, you know you could easily slip into uh, a discussion which involves enough board members that you're that you're you're conducting the business and uh, out of sight you know? And that's a no no. <laughs> and also I, I think that most people who want to be involved, aren't up for the constant stream of hundreds of pages of emails. I think we need to keep it focused um, in these meetings. Right, I mean, it, it, it can slip into, and it has occasionally in the past, um, you know, the, this rapid exchange of, of dozens of emails, which is almost impossible for most people to keep up with. Well, that's why, that's why Google, uh, excuse me, Google Groups makes it easy because they're all in threads. And once a thread is no longer interesting, you no longer read it. Yeah. Well, or, or threads that get carried away, shall we say? Yeah. <laughs> Just right, no exactly. longer read them. Yeah. Well, I must say, you know, there's no um, there's no law that says a Google group can't be set up by a group of interested people to talk about things. Yeah. 
Uh, Joel, I think we should wrap up the meeting. Yep, I agree. <laughs> um, good constructive interaction tonight, I think. Um, we're not we're not there yet, but um, but there's certainly a lot to think about, and and uh, we are making progress, I think. So I'd like to say thanks to the everyone who came, especially people who haven't been to a lot of these meetings. It's great to get more voices in the room. I think we need to keep doing that. Um, yeah. And thanks to everyone for keeping the conversation constructive. Um, we think it was a, a really useful meeting. I'm looking forward to the next one with you all. So next Friday is the Hamlet group um, where we'll focus conversation more directly on the Hamlets. And then two weeks from today will be the next conservation group meeting where we'll dive into more of this stuff. Um, hopefully you're all getting uh, the emails through the town system. If you're not on the town uh, homepage, there's a form to sign up to get those emails. Um, and I'm also posting those um, on the Danby South Hill Facebook group um, just to reach more people. But we'd love to have more people involved. Um, those are just the emails inviting us to the meeting, right? The emails inviting The one we got today. Right. And the one that came a week ago. Yeah. Yeah. Which are going to anybody who was on the in the planning group mailing list. Right, which is about 100. We have over 140 people on the email list that are getting every document that we go through, links to the video of every meeting, um, and information about where they can find more of that stuff. So uh, we're trying to make it so that I know that people are watching those videos uh, offline and have requests for watching this video. So smile and wave, and uh, let's all say good night and move on. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. David, I haven't been getting those. I signed up weeks ago. Good night. Good night. Good night, everybody. Yeah, we should make sure that everybody who was on the planning list is, is getting it. Yeah, yeah, Kim, I think I have two emails for you on that list. Um, I can pull it up right now and tell you who they've been going to. You may have a problem with a spam blocker um, yeah, because I on the list, um, a direct email from me went out today to everyone on the list. Um, and then the other emails, I think they actually show up as if they're from Janice, um, but they're, they say Danby Town News. Um, I so, did get one from you for today. You got the one from me. So that was just me sending a regular, regular old email. Um, but you also should have gotten one, I think more than a week ago. Um, I don't think so. On Friday. I'm trying to find, it, w it went to that same address, but also. Um, so does that, that's the one that goes out through the, through the Danby News, uh, yep. the, the, the website yep. news um, list. But so I have knitchman at gmail.com. Oh, there's, I don't have that. That doesn't exist. That should be bouncing. Um, it's Kim Nitchman. At Gmail. And, uh, Alyssa told me, I spoke with Alyssa earlier today. She said that she wasn't getting them either. Hmm. You know, while you're, while you're doing that, uh, another thing, they're doing the farmer group. Yeah, tomorrow morning. And um, yeah, well, one of the farmers got back to me. I won't say which one said, what the heck are these people thinking about? So this is our planting season. This is our like go to get going, work 80 to 100 hours a week. I, I had that thought. This is, this what is, when, what this is, is in their we're... brains? Do they really want us a part of this group? I, I'm just pointing that out. I mean, he didn't quite say it exactly those words, but um, I mean, it is the hardest time of the year. I, I said it as well, he didn't use profanity. He was very kind. No, no, I meant shorter as in more to the point. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he wasn't nasty, but that was his, I, I elaborated on the 80 to 100 hours a week. I don't know how many farmers you're going to have. He said, well, do they really want farmers involved here? He did say that. Yeah. In the wintertime. Uh, so, I mean, the winter would be best, but we can't back up the clock. That's the trouble. Uh, you know, we're, we're, under, we under, we're under a rather strict well, time frame. I, I've, I've mentioned farmer names by name to Betsy. 
she said she would reach out to him. I hope she really does. And, you know, that's going to take more time on her part to get out there and do that. But, you know, maybe I'll twist her arm and say, listen, are you going and knocking on the door and talking to them and finding out what they want and letting them know what your ideas are? But she really needs to do that. I'll, I'll, I'll annoy her with that. She may yeah. yeah. Yeah, it's hard to show know how many people show up because as you say, Ross, now is the, probably the busiest time of the year for anybody involved in agriculture in any way. I know. <laughs> yeah. we farmers, work, farmers work on Saturdays, really? <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Sometimes at night. <laughs> yes. <laughs> All right. Tim, this is, uh, this is the other Nitchman email that I have on the list. That's right, yes. Yeah. Jim yeah, Nitchman at Gmail, me. that's yeah. correct. So you should be getting those. Um, you should check your spam folder if it's uh, grabbing the emails from the town system. Okay. okay. And and what exactly is the address? Town clerk? Uh, let me see here. Oh, yeah, second, I'll look it up. I'm going to leave. Um, Take care. <laughs> see you, Joel. I'm sorry for the extra time, folks. There it is. It can't, actually came from Danby. Today's came from Danby Planner, um, was Planner at Town of Danby. Yeah, but I today's was that. not was not the news uh, version. You said there was another a week ago. That's what I said. So here's the last one uh, that was news came out on May town four. Clerk. Okay. There was one May four. Out. Yeah, that one came from Town of Danby News, which is town clerk at Town of Danby, New York. Yep. Okay. Thank, Thank you. you. Have a good night. Thank you so it's much, guys. Meeting. Yes, it was. Good to see you. Have a wonderful hey, night. Have a hey, good night. Okay. Hey, Russ, how's the um, how's the uh, mapling doing? Is it all? Oh, it's all, all over. With? It's been over 